Our next uh, presenter is also well known to everybody here in the audience, Dr. Scott Chikora uh, from the Brigham's and past president of ASMBS. And I tried to give the speakers some topics that they never spoke before. And I think sleep apnea, it's a very, very important topic. We are always concerned about diabetes and diabetes, but obstructive sleep apnea causes renal failure, glaucoma. So Scott, what do we do with that? Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, Raul and uh, Dan Jones, who's not here. I want to thank you for inviting me today to speak at the management. And hopefully, uh, we can all educate a bit. Well, this is the obstacle that we're facing, the 500-pound man, the big laparotomy, G-tube. But the issues for him and what ultimately cost him his life was the pulmonary respiratory issues, the sleep apnea. And this fellow did pass away from sleep apnea. So let's start off with airways. This is uh, a not an atypical neck of one of our patients. As you could see, extremely wide. Landmarks are probably near difficult to even palpate. Very, very short neck, big chin. And what you see on the outside is what you see on the inside when you go down and look. And we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, view of the airway from the anesthesia end of things. But there's significant pharyngeal fat, soft tissue, uh, within the airway, compromises the airway. It's extremely difficult for the anesthesiologist to see the landmarks such as the glottis. And for those of you that have any background in pediatric surgery, you may recall how quickly the children desaturate. Their oxygens go way down when they're being intubated. It's the same thing in the obese. And some of the scariest moments that I've had is in the operating room waiting to start a case. Anesthesia is starting to put the patient to sleep. They're having trouble getting the airway. And you watch the SAT monitor just go down to like 60 and your patient turn blue in a matter of minutes. And very often, the anesthesiologist will have to do an awake fiber optic intubation with a scope called the glide scope, as opposed to the conventional intubation where they just use the laryngoscope and they push the head down. Dr. Malampati actually is an anesthesiologist at Brigham and Women's, and he published this a number of years ago. And as you could see from it, most patients who are not obese will have very good landmarks. You could see the uvula, you could see the tonsils, you could see the back of the throat. But unfortunately, lots of our patients are class three and four, where the tongue, the pharynx, and the soft tissues completely obstruct any view of the airway. And then there was something else that I didn't know anything about, but I found this paper about distal airway dysfunction, which is the airways right up in the lungs, the very tiny bronchioles in, uh, that connect to the alveolar sacs. And the obese have a higher resistance, airway resistance, than the average patient. And I'm sorry this doesn't project all that well to the big audience, but what they did in this study was they measured patients who had normal spirometry, which is the conventional way that we measure uh, respiratory function, and found that in some patients who they were able to study a second time after they lost about 20% of their excess body weight, the airway resistance dropped dramatically. So here's another aspect, a very, very not well described aspect of the respiratory dysfunctions we see in the overweight patients that we have to at least think about. So what can we do to help safely intubate the morbidly obese pre-op patient? Well, for those of you in bariatric programs, your anesthesiologists probably have the patients on a number of, uh, of sheets or uh, towels or pads to get that head up, it's called the help position, to try to open up the airway. They have to be well pre-oxygenated, so they have to sit there with the oxygen mask on longer than a thinner patient to get a, her oxygen saturations up as high as possible. They need to immediately have positive airway pressure, whether it's CPAP or BiPAP. Very often the, op the intubation is done awake with a fiber optic scope. They will try to minimize sedatives so that the patient is not completely out and paralyzed when they're trying to go to sleep because if they can't get an airway, then you have a patient who has no airway protection. Rapid sequence to prevent the risk of aspiration and not surprisingly, this population has a higher risk of aspiration and to quickly get them on mechanical ventilation with positive airway pressure. 
Now let's switch gears a little bit, talk about sleep apnea. Uh, one of my colleagues who actually is now a colorectal surgeon was running a bariatric program in uh, the Air Force and he studied consecutive patients coming into the program with sleep studies and found that the incidence of sleep apnea was like nine out of 10 patients. Uh, something that at the time, nobody else really reported. So we have to think about sleep apnea with every preoperative patient who comes in. And what is exactly sleep apnea? Well, it's obstruction of the airway when patients sleep. And it can be both mechanical because of the in increased soft tissue in the back of the throat collapsing when they, they relax and fall asleep, but it's also centrally mediated with the drive center for breathing for whatever reason shuts down. It interrupts the normal sleep cycles, but more importantly, it drops the blood oxygenation. And these patients can have sudden death or other events because of it. Now, it's often underdiagnosed, and what I learned is that if you look at just overall, you could see that almost 50% of men and almost 40% of all women. And that really surprised me, much more than the fact that 80% of patients with sleep apnea are obese. What are the suspicious signs? Well, that neck I showed you before is certainly one. Patients who tell you they snore loudly. I always ask, or my team asks patients about sleeping. We ask the spouse or the significant other, do they sleep well? Do they snore? Do you hear them stop breathing at night when they're sleeping? Patients who tell you that they're very groggy in the mornings, headachey, that they fall asleep driving, that they're fatigued all the time. These may be signs of sleep apnea. And these are the triggers to get a sleep study. Now, what's interesting is probably the best cure for sleep apnea in this population is not surgery or devices, it's uh, weight loss. What are the consequences? Well, the, probably the most serious is sudden death, where the patient is, is found dead in their bed. Now, for the overweight comedians who have died found suddenly dead in bed, if you can eliminate those that died of drugs and alcohol, people like John Candy probably died from sleep apnea. But it's more than that. Aside from the risk of sudden death are the more uh, subtle things that occur over time. Hypertension, cardiac disease, particularly right heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, risk of stroke, and risk of cognitive dysfunction that can happen with long-standing untreated sleep apnea. What are the usual treatments? Well, a lot of patients will be assigned a breathing machine called a CPAP or BiPAP machine that they're supposed to wear at night when they sleep. But the uh, compliance is quite poor for a number of reasons. First of all, it's very uncomfortable and beginning to get used to, and patients won't continue with it enough to get comfortable. Those that do will tell you they sleep better than they've slept in years, they sleep like babies, they feel so refreshed in the mornings, but it's hard for them to get over that hump of starting to use it when they've never used one before. There are oral appliances that you hear on the radio that you can put in the back of your throat and go to sleep with. I don't know how effective those are. I haven't seen any data. There is surgery that can remove parts of the soft palate called a UP3 that was commonly done by ear, ears, nose, and throat doctors. However, those tend to not be effective in the morbidly obese. Weight loss is the best treatment. Now, what's also interesting about sleep apnea is when are patients most vulnerable? And in the first three days after surgery, it's often noticed, and I've noticed it myself, my patients never have apneic episodes. It's unbelievable. And some of the reason is, is that you have to get into REM sleep to have apneic episodes, and in the first few days after surgery in a hospital bed with the commotion, the nurses coming in and out, patients don't sleep deeply enough to go into REM and have apneic episodes. The uh, most vulnerable part is probably after the third day when they're at home, there's what we call REM rebound because of the poor sleep in the hospital and they're still taking narcotics and there may even still be some effect of the analgesics and anesthetics used during surgery. So how do you manage them preoperatively? I think the most important thing is a high index of suspicion. We do not have the capability, even at Brigham and Women's Hospital, to study 100% of my patients with sleep studies. And I don't know any hospital that has that kind of capacity. 
but I think you need a low threshold to send patients for a sleep study. And again, it's the neck, it's their appearance. If they're falling asleep talking to you in the clinic, if you have the history of the snoring or the interrupted sleeping, get a sleep study. For those patients that have sleep apnea, the best treatment we have, short of surgery and weight loss, is the use of a positive airway pressure device such as BiPAP and CPAP. And you really need to encourage your patients not just to pick up the machine, but actually wear it. Rule out hypoxia, the hypoxemia syndrome that goes along with obesity requires oxygen. It's a little different animal, but it's also life-threatening. And I'm a big believer in preoperative weight loss, and I'll show you a slide later on that demonstrates that preoperative weight loss and even moderate weight loss can have tremendous beneficial effects to sleep apnea. As far as the operative management, and again, this really goes more along with our anesthesia colleagues, is that when the operation's over, to make sure the patient is quite awake before you take out the breathing tube, that they're in the upright or lateral position, not laying flat, so that they have to get the airway back in quickly, they can. Immediate positive airway pressure, careful use of narcotics and other medications that may cause respiratory depression, and some form of continuous rest, cardiorespiratory monitoring, such as uh, EKG, SAT monitor. This is not the patient who should go to the back at the end of the hallway in the end of the ward away from the nursing station. This is the patient whose bed should be closest to the nursing station or in some type of a monitored setting like a step-down unit or in some cases even intensive care unit after surgery. Early ambulation is always important. Pulmonary toilet is always important. Start the CPAP and BiPAP early. When I was training, we didn't start it for four days after surgery because we were told it would cause anastomotic leaks. In fact, the literature does not support that. It does not cause anastomotic leaks. Uh, just follow up a study by Harvey Sugarman that demonstrated that patients who have bariatric surgery, in this case these were gastric bypasses, have a tremendous improvement in sleep apnea, not only in clinical symptoms, but when you measure the apnea index, they statistically significantly fell after surgery with weight loss. And I alluded to this earlier, this is John Dixon's study where he compared conventional weight loss best medical weight loss to ban surgery and demonstrated that actually both groups had benefits to uh, the apneic uh, hypoxic episodes, obviously better with surgery, but not statistically significantly so. So this just reinforces for me that preoperative weight loss may benefit patients going into surgery as far as their severe sleep apnea. So in conclusion, amongst the other comorbid conditions, we talk about diabetes and hypertension. We need to keep in mind both pulmonary and respiratory disorders and dysfunctions. We should do the appropriate preoperative assessment. We should uh, aid our patients with preoperative weight loss, get them using their CPAP, and make sure that the operative experience of intubation and extubation are done by an experienced senior anesthesiologist with good airway control and management. And once again, Raul, and Dan, wherever you are, I want to thank you again for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shikor.